With me today is a special guest. He's appeared in TV shows like Party of Five, Silicon Valley, Major Crimes, Cleaners, and Last Resort. Currently, he can be seen on CBS's SWAT. If you're a fan of The Shield, you will know him as Detective Ronnie Gardaki. David Reesnell joins me on The Shattered Shield today. How are you doing, David? I'm doing well, Andrew. Thank you very much. You are a major, major, major requested guest here. <laughs> I do have to start with a traditional question, which is how you first got involved with The Shield. I've heard a little bit of, about it from uh, Sean, but I was looking to get your perspective on that. So how did you first hear about the project, and how did you get involved? I first heard about the project when I uh, got a script from Sean Ryan. He had written a pilot that he seemed pretty happy with. He was working on Angel at the time. He gave it to me, and I promptly... Uh, put it on a shelf in my apartment and didn't look at it for several <laughs> weeks. <laughs> now, I, when I moved to Los Angeles, I only knew one person, Jay Carnes. Jay and I yeah. had gone to college together at the University of Kansas. By my senior year, Jay was commuting in and doing a class or two, doing plays in the theater department as I was, and he would stay overnight at my in my apartment at times when he didn't want to drive back to his family's house, which was, you know, 45 minutes away or so from town, from the college. There was a, a national acting contest involved with a national theater contest. And Jay won the region that we were in. And I finished second in our region. It's very troubling to me still. But he, <laughs> his, he, he went to the nationals. And one of the things that he, that he got from nationals was a, a trip to a playwrights retreat where he met Sean. And so he moved out to L.A. When I moved out, the only person I knew was Jay. When Sean moved out, the only person he knew was Jay. We pretty quickly started doing plays together that Sean had written. We did a number of plays that no one wanted to come see, uh, <laughs> but that were, that were pretty good, you know. And then I moved away for a little while. I went to Kansas City, and I was working the theater there. And then I moved back out. At that time, that's when Sean wrote the, the S.H.I.E.L.D. pilot, which was called The Barn at that point. I was doing uh, a production of Arms and the Man. You know, then it started to, you know, it was going to happen. You know, they're going to make this pilot. And so I just finished Arms and the Man. I had this big uh, Van Dyke. My wife, who was not yet my wife, Melanie, she was gone or something, and I was shaving my Van Dyke, and I, I uh, you know, I was going to go in and read for the barn, uh, you know, as you sometimes do, you're like, oh, I'll just shave, you know, the bottom part of it and keep this mustache here and see what that looks like. Yeah. And I looked at it and I thought, well, this looks like a cop. I look like a cop. <laughs> um, and I, I went in and read, you know, with the, with the mustache. And I read at that point, you just read for Shane or Lemonhead on the strike team and the other roles. So I read for Shane and my, my recollection, not very well. I remember seeing Jay at the audition, uh, as well as you know a lot of other people. I, and they auditioned for quite a while. Yeah. Walton got cast, and and uh, every everyone else. I got a call from I think I was on with Sean and Scott Brazil in the same call. Scott being the co-executive producer and uh, director, and the late Scott Brazil, and and the yeah sort of the money budget guy. He was an interesting guy because he was able to do creative stuff very well, but also prosaic stuff that is not as much fun, but tremendously important about right. how you, you get the thing done under budget and et cetera. Anyway, they called and said that um, they wanted to have another member of the strike team, but they could not afford it in the pilot. And they wanted to see if I would play an extra in the pilot they would get me more money than an extra would make, which is not to say a whole bunch, but, and then I would have a role if the show were to go, you know, I wouldn't speak in the pilot. I said, well, I, I'll think about it. <laughs> 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 and I did. And, you know, I thought, well, like, how big is this role ever going to get? It's the fourth guy on the strike team at that point. They figured out the Lemonhead character and gotten Kenny yeah. and I imagine although I hadn't met any of these people yet. And I was really right about a lot of things. Like, okay, well, he's the fourth guy in the strike team. He's starting from a guy who doesn't say anything at all. So, you know, how, how you know, this is always going to get the least amount of, of uh, attention 
But, you know, what I didn't understand, because I hadn't really done television until then. I'd done a few movies, and I hadn't really lived out here very long. I'd come out here, you know, no one would pay any attention to me. I wasn't in the union yet, yet and stuff. And then I'd gone away to the Midwest and worked around various places in the Midwest, but came back out here and was just kind of doing theater again. What I, what I thought was, well, maybe it'd be like a, a really cool other role that would come along that would be fun, you know, more, yeah. more, more showy. But, I, you know, that was me being very unsavvy about just how television works. You know, OK, the greatest guest star in the world is just a guest star that you get paid for once. You know, you know right, I mean, right. that's, just, that's just the way of it. And maybe, you know, maybe it gets so much attention that you've got this great tape and people watch it and they go, I want to see this guy. And you get that opportunity. But but maybe not. I mean, The Shield was on a network that people said, you know, what are you doing? Oh, I'm doing this show on this network FX. Everyone everyone to a person said, Oh, I think I get FX. You know, that's where we were at that time. Like like, people did not know, you know, if they had FX, if they didn't have FX, I was a, I was an extra on the pilot. And what ultimately got me over to, to do it was not any of the smart reasons like, Oh, well maybe this show will go and you'll be on the show and it'll go for seven seasons and you'll buy a house. No, I I thought, well, this might be the only thing they ever do when Jay and Sean are doing it. And I just want to hang out with them. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And that was great. Uh, And and that really did work out. And that really was the last time that I saw Sean on the set very much. You know, that Sean was there on the set every day for the, for the pilot. And then after that, the writers are off really working on many, many episodes at once. And there's editing right, and there's, right. you know, network studio. Sean would come down to the stage maybe, I don't know, two or three times a year, usually happily to tell us we got picked up for another season, you know, things of that nature. Or he would be bringing in um, some director who they were interested in, in working on the show and kind of showing them around. But that was the last time that I saw Sean much, maybe the last episode of the season he would be down a little bit more. He certainly would have been down a lot for the last episode of the series, but that was during the writer's strike. So that's a shame. But that's, yeah. Yeah. Oh man, it really was. It really was. But that's basically how, how I got involved in the show. I had worked with Sean previously a number of times, mostly, you know, all in the theater and he knew, you know, what kind of actor I was. It's a difficult thing because they wanted the continuity of having the same person be on the strike team. But, you know, unless you actually knew this person, like if I didn't know these people at all and they were saying, hey, we want you to be an extra, but this is going to be a role if it happens. Well, you don't, I mean, if you don't know them right, right. I, 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 onto a network that, that they've never heard of or never have done anything, like what, who's going to do that, you know? So that really worked out in my favor. I'm not sure how aware of this you are, but Ronnie, after here we sit, what, 10, almost 20 years, I guess, at this point after the beginning of the show, Ronnie has become this like mythical character in terms of fandom. I can attest to articles upon articles that I've read about his backstory being uh, from, you know, having extensive military training or being some kind of killer on the side you know, all this crazy stuff. And they'll, they'll cherry pick all your dialogue and say, well, he knew about the military tattoo on the guy in this episode and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But I'd love to hear if there's any backstory or character work that you created for Ronnie in order to help you portray him on screen. Yes and no. Okay. I have to admit that when I started, like The Shield was the first bit of open-ended storytelling I had ever done. So everything else that I'd ever done, whether it be on stage or on screen, had a, a beginning, middle, and end. I think it was a little bit of hubris, to be honest. Like I thought one of my strengths was, was uh, script analysis and figuring out where I fit in the story and how I could best tell this story from wherever I was coming from, whether I was the main character or a secondary character, how can I tell this story? And then I got to a story where I didn't know what the story was. Mm. I was pretty stymied by that. And it took me some time to understand that it didn't matter <laughs> that I didn't know what the story was, <laughs> that I could make up my own idea about who Ronnie was. Yeah. And if they wrote something that contradicted that, I'm the only one who knows that, 
you know, that I could just incorporate that into my thing. I could just do a little rewrite of my backstory or my story or whatever. Yeah. And all is good. So it took me some time to understand that was kind of my job. Like I could see, I could see the how that if, you know, if you, if you very specific about what you're doing, what ends up happening is the writers will often like recognize that and then start writing to it. At first I was really thrown. Like I, 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 and I also remember talking to, I don't know how many actors who, I don't know, a few actors who I feel like just kind of like every, they're, they're, they're very good. But when I see them, I kind of see them do the same thing over and over again. And yet these actors also had these extensive biographies of the characters. So I'm like, right. well, how is this possible that you're just kind of doing the same thing you always do? Right, <laughs> I, right. Of course, I wouldn't say that to them. But at the same time, it I, I realized now, what, what, or I realized even then, it took me a while, but it freed them up to be themselves because they weren't playing. It's hard to, you know, I, I'm not going to do anything that Ronnie did. I'm not going to bust down a door with my, with a gun out and people I don't know. You know, I, I know they're dangerous. <laughs> None of that am I yeah. ever going to do. So if you're like, Hey, just be yourself. I'm like, well, we got a problem right off the bat. You know what I mean? I cannot mm. be myself and do this thing right now because I ain't doing that. Ronnie ended up being a number of people that I kind of knew and, and grew up with and experienced. There was a, there was an actor that I knew from college who ended up moving out here to be an actor. Uh, you know, things didn't work out very well as they mostly don't. And he got interested in joining the LAPD. And I think when, <laughs> I was told second half, but like one of the questions was, you know, like, have you ever smoked weed? And, you know, we'll know if you, if you lie. And so he said, yes. And then later they were like, listen, you, you, you can't say yes to that question. You know, this was, <laughs> you know, this was like in the nineties. He's like, but you know, yeah. long you, you can try, try the sheriffs, but don't tell them you smoke weed, you know, just, and then maybe you can transfer over. I thought of Ronnie as a guy who played football in high school and was like a, a safety, one of the, one of the, you know, more of a, of a hitting uh, safety, like cover guy yeah. in the defensive backfield kind of came out to Los Angeles following a, a girl. And then she wanted to be an actress and started taking acting classes, became sort of interested in the type of guy that I was not anymore or ever was, right, you know, right. I mean, she, you know, th these are all amalgams of things that I've, that happened to people I knew. And, you know, yeah. I was a team guy. I was, uh, uh not averse to violence. Um, you know, I, I fell into, you know, to being a cop in that way. So the, the strike team as a team was something that was really, uh, attractive to me. And also, you know, also, you know, when you're on a team, there's always a, a lot of people who feel like the team is not doing the right things so or the coach is not using them the right way and that sort of thing. And I think Ronnie was a little bit like that as well. Right? Yeah. Uh, war games, et cetera, you know, like uh, right, video right, games. Right. War games. So that Ronnie's interest became, you know, into, you know, military stuff and high tech stuff and, you know, surveillance and all these things that he just, <laughs> He just indulged all his peccadilloes that happened to coincide with what he did. Like that, what ended up being his job on the strike team were, were all the things that really interested him. The wiretapping and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, you know, I might, I, I, <laughs> to my mind, I, I was also a guy who like, you hear about these guys who, uh, or people that, that, you know, get into magic and they start working on cards all the time. Like that to my mind, Ronnie had a, you know, he would have like a, a bunch of locks at home and he'd be, you know, he'd work the picks, uh, you know, that yeah. while he was always watching some, some, you know, <laughs> world war two documentary that he enjoyed yeah. that. Like that was, that was, you know, he, he had, you know, he would find that time is just, you know, three hours were gone and he was just work, trying right, to pick right. locks. You know. That's great. So this one I actually have to credit CHW three. It's a user on the shield Reddit that's still active to this day. Wow. Help me formulate this next question here. The community as a whole always wanted like a Ronnie specific episode. So we got limbs and throw away. Shane arguably could be two days of blood, but, you know, he's a main feature in the entire series. You've got Kavanaugh, you know, Kavanaugh gets his own. Everybody's dying to have this Ronnie episode. At least we still are. So if that were to happen, <laughs> if we could take a time machine back there and give you the opportunity to have an episode that was focused on Ronnie in particular, what would that episode look like in your mind? What would you have liked to explore for him? Oh, man. Well, 
when Ronnie got his face burned, mm, yes, that I thought, okay, well, let's see what happens to Ronnie now, you know. But <laughs> I realized, oh, oh, no, no, this is not about what happened to Ronnie. This is about what happened to Vic. Vic did this thing, and now Vic's retribution is this happens to his 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 boy, his guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah. I thought this happened to me, but it happened to Vic. Uh, so like on a larger storytelling scale, it, that's what it was about. It wasn't about what happened to Ronnie. So I think maybe on some level, I think that there's divergence the that, you know, that that Ronnie, you know, where did that take me? That that I that that those episodes were all my, on my own, you know. I don't have a good answer for what that what that episode would be. Because, you know, like you said, like over the course of all those seasons, you know, Lim had won, you know. Um, right, yeah. I wasn't ever under the impression that I was likely to have an episode. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, I, what I wanted was a distinctive point of view that was separate from everyone else's. Yes. That it wasn't just the yeah. strike team thinks this, or Vic feels like this, and then the, bo- the guys are blah, 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 you know. Right. And it took me a while to realize, oh, oh, that's that's my responsibility. Yeah, I went and auditioned for graduate schools in acting, and I, I remember, you know, auditioning for this one fairly fancy school, and they were like, "What are your dream roles?" And I, I happened to have been really sick when I was auditioning for them, and so I was just barely getting through the audition. I didn't realize after the audition that various schools were going to want to meet with me, <laughs> so I thought yeah, I, had, yeah. you know made it through uh, and I just couldn't even think all I could think of was the music man which I knew they did not want to hear <laughs> and, uh, and, and it was, you know just to, just to play the, uh, the I remember staying up late when I was sick watching that with my mom and for some reason that was stuck in my mind at the time but I, it, it didn't occur like there wasn't that wasn't something that I did that oh I want to play this role I want to play that role I wanted to play whatever was like in front of me but I didn't have like these macro goals that seemed like that was someone else's choice about what play is going to be done. So I wonder if it'd be, it'd be interesting to see how, like, what if, uh, <laughs> what if I pitched this story for Ronnie or that story for Ronnie, but I'm sorry. People are going to have better ideas for a Ronnie episode than I am. It's interesting that people have formed this connection that they have with Ronnie. Uh, there's actually, Sean had mentioned this, one of the top things he gets tweeted is a hashtag free Ronnie <laughs> on Twitter. Yeah. And people just have this strong connection to this character. What do you think about Ronnie? Is it that people resonate with? Like, what do you think that that is? I thought of this some, um, I don't know if I'm right. I feel like Ronnie is someone you can project onto. Yeah. You know, that, that you can project onto Ronnie what, what you want. That for a long, he wasn't particularly well-defined for a while. And, you know, there was just this sort of feeling like Ronnie was the, the most kind of like normal person on the team. You know, it's hard to kind of imagine yourself as Lem. Right, right. Very low key. Vic is kind of a superhero. and Shane's kind of a supervillain. You know, Ronnie, like I'd be Ronnie. You know, I think maybe that's there's a part of a part of you that's like that. And you kind of mentioned this earlier. You said that um, you, you kind of pictured Ronnie as a team player and he was obviously very loyal to the strike team. There's a few particular pieces of dialogue that would indicate conflicting ideas to me there's there's one in particular where ronnie tells vic you know i'm not going to spend the rest of my life wearing state property (laughs) he just straight up says that to him at some point yeah Yeah. he does say to vic you know i wish you'd have told me about terry he kind of worked that out himself and says i could have protected you better and looked out for you so i guess the question i've got here is if if lem was really obstructing Ronnie's freedom and it was to the point where they couldn't get out of it do you think that he would have went along with Vic if Vic had proposed killing Lem because Ronnie's very very against that and and hates Shane pretty much for the rest of the show he's down with killing him at any time and I and I wonder if that perspective would have been changed had the order come from Vic so what do you think about that do you think his end-all be-all was was Vic's word or was he more loyal to himself and just got caught up in the game you know, it is hard for me to imagine the, the scenario in which Vic thinks Lim has to go. But, you know, obviously I- anything can happen. I I think I always mistrusted Shane with good reason. Mm-hmm. 
but Lem always felt like someone who was completely loyal. You know, Ronnie, I think, thought of himself as someone who put himself first. I always had a theory yes. that that everyone in the strike team thought they were better than Vic at a certain thing. Like, or, or mm. were like Vic in a certain way. Like, Lem was as tough as Vic. I, I thought I was as smart as Vic. Man, that's fascinating. I haven't thought about that. Shane thought he was as charismatic and influencing as Vic. But none of us could do the other things that Vic could do. Right, right. I thought that I could skate at any time. That I saw the faults of everybody. That I was clear-headed about what we were doing, how we were doing it, and how it was going to end. And this is when you're talking about the writing and the backstory and that sort of thing, there's a level of, well, you just, you know, then I didn't, you know, they didn't write it that way. Right. Yeah. So what is my response to that? And my response to that was, what else was Ronnie going to do? Like this was the best yeah. situation that Ronnie could ever have imagined. And he couldn't let it go. He couldn't walk yeah. away from it to what, you know, Mexico. I mean, you know, like right. what, what, what was he, what was his life going to be? So he could not, it's like being in a, in a very bad relationship where you stay in that bad relationship because you cannot envision the aftermath. Yeah. That's strong. If Vic felt that way, I would have also had to have felt that way, but you know, then it wouldn't have been because Vic said so it's because Vic said so. And I felt that too. Yeah, like I, yeah. I felt like we should take out Shane but Vic did not. So I did. Yes. I mean, I, this is kind of a, a wild aside, but I happen to be reading Lonesome Dove right now. I don't know if you've ever read it. It's an amazing work and a really amazing television miniseries with horrible, um, horrible dated special effects and things, but two amazing actors, you know, playing the, the main roles. And there's a, the, these two former Texas Rangers are the, are the main characters and there's Augustus McCray and, uh, and Captain Call and both of them are very different guys but in the, and this is a horrible thing to tell you since you haven't read it and probably most people haven't but one of the things is it, it's a very different and if one person one of those two guys believes something you're like oh maybe that's true but often the other guy believes the opposite if they both believe the same thing then you as the reader know that's just true so I feel right, like that's yeah. kind of how I felt about Ronnie and Vic. If Vic believed the thing had to happen and I believed the thing had to happen, I felt comfortable with that thing. If there was a situation in which that happened with Lem, then then I would uh I would do whatever had to be done. But but Lem was a mm -hmm. uh, was not Shane, I always assumed at some point would become more hazardous to our health than helpful. I have to ask you about this this end scene. I would be remiss. Because we know at the end of the day, Ronnie is the fall guy for the strike team. Mm -hmm. and this one is uh, Andreas Got Me, is the user that helped me with this one here. How many takes in specific did it take for that last scene to be filmed? Because that is a very intense scene. As a matter of fact, I would say that I've watched the show five times fully. But if there's one clip I pull up and watch and still get the raw motion from, it's it's Ronnie's arrest. Hmm. Wow, that's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, oh, yeah, of course. What was the feeling like on the set when you were shooting that? Like, what are your memories of that? And how many takes did it take? Because I can't imagine you'd be able to do that multiple times. That that seemed very, very intense. The feeling on the set was like a party. <laughs> that was the last <laughs> real scene that we shot of the show. Yeah. And everybody was done with their difficult things except for me. And so everybody was just in, you know, in uh, cast party mode, to be honest, that, that, that was, uh, you know, the, the crew still had plenty of work to do, but to some of the crew, most of their work was done, you know, and, and the cast was all there hanging around and everybody, you know, all the, <laughs> all the difficulty was, had happened. And uh, except for me, and I realized, oh man, this isn't helpful to me at all. So I just got mad at them 
Uh, I just got mad at them <laughs> and kept it to myself. That's that's great. Um, I'm I'm trying to think of takes. We never did a whole bunch of takes of anything on the Shield. Jay and CC come in. And Jay comes in. And, you know, it says, like, for the last three years or whatever it was, five years, I was like, for what? What am I, I thought, I thought I'd covered myself. So I think we did it three, four times. And I don't know, I, I think it was a wonder uh, when they dragged me off. That's crazy. You nailed it. I, I, I hate to, I don't want to interrupt you, but you just, you nailed that scene. <laughs> oh, well, so you know, uh, I was mad at everyone. Uh, <laughs> no, I remember like Kenny, Kenny had come back. Kenny was there. He oh, was there cool. just kind of to hang out and be there for the end of the show. We, we literally had to shoot an exterior of, of Chickless and I creeping up on a building that we went back. Yes. Like the next, I think maybe that was a Friday and we went back the next Monday or maybe it was the next day. That was the last thing, which was really anticlimactic and a little bit sad. But the, so the, effectively, the last, the last thing shot on the show was, was my arrest. And what I remember about that was one of the arresting officers was a stuntman, and one was our technical advisor, who had been a uh, LAPD. I had, I think in the rehearsal, I went at it pretty hard in the rehearsal, Catherine Dent wanted to be one of my arresting officers. She wanted to be a part of that scene, which I totally understood. But then when she kind of saw how I was going to completely freak out, she, she thought, mm -hmm. no, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and I didn't, which was great because I didn't want to have to worry about, about that. I wanted, I want to tell these guys, okay, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. To, you know, take care of it. Two was when, when Chicklets, when I lurched at Chicklets in one of the takes, they pulled me back and my momentum was going forward. And as they pulled my top half back, my legs flew out from under me and I kicked him right in the groin, just oh, up man. and under, just boom, just right there. And he just kind of like, Oh, he just took it and kept going with the scene. Cause, <laughs> you know, it, you, you couldn't, none of the cameras were on that. If he was on that, he would have played sure. it, but they weren't on that. He didn't want to burst the take. So, I appreciate that, but I kind of thought, you know what? That's what you get. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then dragging off all the way to the to the cage. I, I I just think that there was, you know, just a shock and, like you said, this belief that I had that I was going to get away with it. From my perspective, as a kind of like the outsider saying, "Oh, what else was Ronnie going to do? This is why he stayed in." Ronnie never had that feeling he always thought he was going to get out and to be honest i it's i tell you andrew it's so weird how you kind of meld with your character in strange ways and you yeah. start to want you know uh, ronnie to get away with it which is <laughs> right well which is really neither here nor there like why do i care whether ronnie gets away with it to be honest you know like right, what right but but that's what you kind of want and then people started coming up to me like we'd be you know, in between takes or something, and someone would sidle up and be like, you're going to be the one that gets away. And I'm like, yeah, you think so? And then after a number of people, like, I don't know, three, four, five, six people came up and said something like that, I realized, oh, man, I'm uh -oh. not going to get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am not funny. getting away with it. Um, but yeah. I, I remember we did, like I said, we did that during the writer strike. So none of the, none of the writer producers Man, that's uh, were there for that. In fact, the last time we saw the writer producers was the read through. We got the read through in under the wire before the strike began. I was working the day of the read through and I got there and I remember a number of people, I mean, maybe two or three people. I remember Marciano was one of them. And somebody else would be like, hey, have you read the script yet? Oh, man, tough stuff. Mm. You know, looking at me like, what's going to, I'm like, what is going to happen? And I remember exactly sitting outside of the studio commissary reading that script and there was nobody around and I was just reading it. I got to the Ronnie scene. I realized, oh, my God, what a great scene this is. And then, you know, finishing off the script and I realized, oh, my God, this is going to be great. 
Yeah. All we have to do is shoot this script and it's going to be great. And I knew we could do it. We'd been doing it for years. And I knew we could deliver on what the script was asking us to do. And it was such a great script. It was, in my mind, such a great ending that I just, yes. I was yep. weirdly so relieved and happy. And, and also just, I mean, I, I couldn't have asked for a more exciting scene for Ronnie. Yeah, to 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 go out with, and and how how boring would have Ronnie been escaping then? Like what well, we've seen Ronnie sleep in the night on the beach. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. you know what I mean. I, I I was so glad that Ronnie got caught uh, ultimately, but yeah, I remember you know just people cutting up and having a great time, just fooling around, and me being like, what the heck? I, I, you know, uh, Walton, who is, you know, famously, uh, uh, you know, getting into character and staying in his character and being, you know, like, oh, he's having the greatest time and making everybody laugh. I'm like, what are you doing? I don't do that when yeah. you have your big thing. <laughs> yeah, you're but trying I, to uh, get in the zone and everybody's blowing party streamers. <laughs> right, which, <laughs> which, you know, made all the sense in the world. This was the end of our of our time. Sure. Here, which was intense. Yeah. and. And really, so special, um, and in ways that I couldn't even understand at that time. I'd, I'd not done anything else on television. You know, I'd not had a different experience to go. Oh, this was, you know, this yeah. was more special than that. I had my most special experience first. And we've kind of talked about this on the podcast before. One of my personal like fan wishes, and, and I know that this wasn't technically possible just because of the nature of the show, but. I had always wanted to see like more characters interact with each other that we didn't often get to see. Now you brought up Danny wanting to be one of your arresting officers or, or um, Catherine Dent, mm -hmm. like maybe a Ronnie Danny scene, for example. So I was wondering what actor or actress, uh, regular or guest star that you would have liked to had more scenes with. Is there any character in particular? I was really happy to get one episode with Jay because I, I you yes. know, was so such good friends with Jay and remain such good friends with Jay and always enjoy working with Jay. If there had been more, that would have been, that would have been great for me. That was always made me really happy. I think I, I thought to some extent, Oh, Ronnie's love life is some way into Ronnie. You know, I thought for a moment that, uh, that there might be something between Tina and, and, yes. and Ronnie. Yes. Yeah, she actually gives him a look after she tackles that guy, or you tackle that guy in the in that particular episode you're mentioning. Yeah, you know the truth is that that was unlikely to to get very far in the first place, and all it would do is you know, like what what was the you know the complications involved? Ronnie probably should keep it outside of the precinct with yeah. with all that he's got going on. Glenn Close was so interesting and and fun and just goofier than I expected. I don't know what I you know I thought Glenn Close was going to be you know like um like above us all in some way. And she just came in, told a crazy story on herself from 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> and, uh, and we're like, oh, well, okay, Glenn's in, she's in. So it would have been fun to have a fun scene with her. I got to have a fun scene with, uh, with Forrest and he was, he was really interesting. But yeah, I think I'd, I would say Glenn. I would say Glenn would okay. be my, would be my, my hope. I'm a stickler for detail. And we've really, really been paying really close attention to like all the small little touches you guys put in the show. And one of them that I always appreciated is the fact that we are, you know, six, seven seasons deep and y'all still had the makeup for Ronnie Scar. I'm not going to call any shows out, but I've seen shows where, you know, they'll particularly give somebody a scar and then the two or se three seasons later, they don't have it anymore. That oh. always drives me crazy. But Ronnie always had that grill mark on his face. So how long did that take to apply? <laughs> and that's kind of a softball question, but I'm still curious. Uh, well, it is. That's an easy one, but I'll go a little bit deeper on that. So when, when they decided to do, you know, the retribution where I got my face grilled, Scott was very insistent that it not be so gruesome that we didn't ever want to see Ronnie's face. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I think I wanted it to be a little more gruesome than he did. Uh, but probably once again, I was wrong uh, in the moment. But what we ended up doing, Jennifer Zide, our uh, our lead makeup 
artist would put that scar on me most every day. And that scar was just like a temporary tattoo that, that a kid might, you know, put oh, okay. on with, uh, with, with water. You placed it on my face. It had texture to it is the only difference. It was a textured temporary tattoo. And it took maybe five minutes maximum. It was, it was unbelievable. I, if I recall right, I may not be right about this, but as I remember, she told me they cost about $15 a piece. I'd peel it off at the end of the day. But uh, it would be, you know, cost prohibitive to do in, in most theaters and sort of things. But it was just, a, it was a temporary tattoo. It was astonishingly effective, uh, but super easy. What was worse than that was like when I got uh, hit in the, uh, in, the, in the church or something, and then they decided they needed to put stitches in my head and shave a chunk out of my, uh, my hair and my head. And, and, and then every episode after that was like a day later. And so I had like, I don't know three months in which I had this hole shaved in my hair. <laughs> what? I thought that was like a makeup piece. I didn't know you actually shaved your head. No, That's nuts. No, it was, yeah, I think they looked forward to me. Oh, how can we annoy Snow personally? Uh, but, but, <laughs> now we got to shave it. We got to, we got to do that. What? And then each episode would come out to be like the next day. I'm like, Oh my God. <laughs> That's crazy. But, you know, I'd already dealt with the mustache for so long. You know, I had this idea about this mustache. I'd never done anything for more than a couple of months at a time. It did not occur to me I was going to go mustached for, you know, nine months. Not really a good look for me at all. People were going to get <laughs> married while I had this mustache. It was, it was, Some people yeah. would argue that. Some people prefer the stash running, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> That's funny. I've got two questions here. Now, they're a little bit heavy. But these are the last two I got here. Okay. And this is this is a repeat question I ask here to everybody because um, I, I think it's important. What is the biggest takeaway as an actor that you took from working on The Shield? If you had to choose one aspect that remained with you beyond the show, what would that be? I, I think it goes back to, as I said, this was my, this was my first experience with open-ended storytelling. So it was about... Uh, my responsibilities as an actor in a in an open-ended storytelling environment. The other thing that was huge on The Shield was you had two cameras moving at all times. And so there was, uh, you know, th there will be some shows where you'll do, I'm in a scene with someone and they'll shoot all of them and I'm just reading off camera, and then they'll turn around and shoot all of me, and that person will leave. Most of the time that happens, it's, it's because the production is saying, listen, we have to cut this person now because they've got to come back 12 hours later, and we don't want to pay them overtime to do the scene with you, or they're just exhausted, or they don't feel good, you know, so, something very reasonable, and I'm fine with doing it. Uh, it. That's not a thing. But on The Shield, you were never off camera. You were always on camera. And so that's how I try to behave, even when I know I'm completely off camera, you know. Uh, now, there are some technical aspects to it. You don't want to be, you know, you want to be quiet when your camera's not on you, <laughs> you know, right, as far right, as your yeah. sounds go or the things you pick up or set down and things like that. That's just going to make things more difficult for your, for your editors and your sound people and stuff. But I try to give the performance that I, that I, each time, no matter, no matter what happens. But the great thing about the shield was you, there was never a sense that no one ever took scenes off or half scenes off. You couldn't do it. It wasn't possible. And so that really made it great for everybody. I remember at one point, uh, Richie Cantu, uh, the B camera operator was like, listen, you gotta, you gotta find my camera. And I'm like, I, I'm, I'm trying to find it, Richie, you're moving it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, but that was pretty early on. So anyway, you know, when I went to some other shows, which were shot much more traditionally, it was just so much easier. So there yeah. was a level of, um, every movie or TV movie or whatever I'd done before had been shot more traditionally. It's funny to think now that, that the style of the shield was very much inspired by the show cops, which, you know, you might mm -hmm. come to the shield now and not have any idea what, what cops was like at all. The other thing I would say, I think there are a lot of them. I, I could go on and on about this question, but there were just so many ways to do it. 
like, like I said, Walton would be off by himself, you know, psyching himself into his headspace. <laughs> Chickless would be telling some story or some joke right up through, uh, right until you say action, basically. And that you had to find your own way. I mean, there's a lot of things that, that are said before action, you know, rolling and sound and all these things in which happen and then action happens. And Chickless, I remember the season ender for uh, season one when he essentially has this panic attack. Yeah, yeah. That was the first time I'd seen Chiklis have to kind of prepare before the scene started in any way, like put himself into a state before the scene started. Every other time, you wouldn't you wouldn't know he was doing anything other than say hosting a, you know, a big you know, meal for people. Uh, and it took me a while to go, oh, okay, well that's great for you. I cannot be the person that you're chatting with you know, before this, or I, I, I can just kind of nod and uh-huh you and yeah, and, and just not be paying attention to you because I'm not going right. to be any good like that. Um, so there, there was just a lot of variety in how people approached their, their work. I think really, really interesting. I think on the shield also, I've done a lot of different shows and I had a lot of different experiences and sometimes I've seen on shows where there are, you know, people are just kind of tired of this show. You know, they got the show, they're happy yeah. to have that job, they, et cetera, et cetera. They're not that interested in what they're doing, really. Mm. Um, and uh, that just never did happen on the show. You know, we didn't do, we were doing 13 episodes. I mean, now you might see a six episode season, an eight episode season. Uh, you know, I haven't done one of those but at the time 13 episodes was like the new short season and yes. and and it felt like a short season now 13 episodes might feel like a long season to some people but in that it felt like a short season i think that i made it a little easier on people not getting particularly bored or anything i, I think more than anything else it was that everyone seemed to really enjoy the the scripts and the story and, and the crazy stuff that would get written and the, trying to figure out how to get out of this corner we painted ourselves in. But to me, it was about the experience of working on something for a long time, how to do it, what it meant, you know, and then basically working with a lot of people with a lot of, a lot of pride who put a lot of effort in, who cared a lot. And that's what I, always try to do. I think there were times in, when I was young in my acting to career where I think I sometimes thought, oh, well, this isn't very good, this thing that I'm doing, and I didn't put everything I had into it. That was just the wrong way to do it. All you can do is the very best you can, you know, and bring everything yeah. you can to it. And some things are going to be better than others. I mean, some performances of mine are better than others. It, it, you just try to do the best that you can. But I, I think that weirdly on a show that I thought was really great, I learned that I needed to do that, whether I thought it was great or not. I don't recall there being as much. See, that was a lot more physical okay. and, out, and out, outward uh, yeah. uh, explosive. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's not, you know, he had a lot of scenes where all, he went from being, you know, a nice guy to roughing somebody up, punching somebody, shoving somebody over, rushing up. Right, on right, someone. right. Yeah. And I, I, I don't think so. Here's the big question for you. And this is the one that uh, a lot of people talk about to this day. It's about Ronnie's particular fate and future in the S.H.I.E.L.D. universe. So if you were to reprise that role, if you were interested in doing that, I don't even know if you would be or not. Where do you see Ronnie 10 years after the show has ended, 20 years after the show has ended? I've heard things ranging from he's out and he's looking for revenge on Vic. He's, you know, he's a gang leader in jail. Where do you see Ronnie in the S.H.I.E.L.D. universe at this point, if there were to be like a, a follow up to the series? I had very briefly kind of worked on an idea of Ronnie getting out of prison. And, you know, having prison, you know, harden and change him in a way, <laughs> um, because yeah. obviously going to prison for anybody at any time is pretty horrible. Right. But going in as a cop who was right. yeah. particularly bad to everyone <laughs> would be like the worst situation <laughs> to be in. So let's, 
assume that Ronnie got through it, he would have to get through it, you know, Schillinger from Oz kind of way. So my idea was that Ronnie, you know, kind of gets out and, and then he had hidden his stash. Like they never found his stash and he's going back after his money, you know, uh, that is not where it's supposed to be. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of a first things first. I mean, I may, uh, have a lot of antipathy towards Vic and everything, but first I want my money, you know? Yeah. That that was kind of how I, how I saw it. Like if, if Ronnie was to survive prison, he would have to survive by becoming sort of a apex predator type of guy. Yeah. Yeah. Back to my idea of like, you know, all of us having a little bit of Vic, but not enough of Vic to like, like each one of us thought we could do Vic's job and everyone would have failed because they couldn't juggle all the balls that Vic could juggle, you know, but right. that, that, that Ronnie would acquire another, a certain amount of, uh, uh you know, lose some of his humanity, <laughs> which would help him yeah. in some way. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I guess we'll say a uh, hashtag free Ronnie then. Yeah. <laughs> Just to, to wrap like, it up. <laughs> like whether, whether, you know, whether anybody would want to free Ronnie at that point, if that's the case, I don't know. But uh, yeah. You are at Dr. Snell on Twitter, and I stated earlier you can be seen on CBS's SWAT. You play Detective Burroughs. I was pleasantly surprised to see you on there. Is yeah, there anything else that you would like to talk about? Oh, not really. There are a couple irons in the fire, but you never know, and there's no reason to, to jinx anything. But sure. yeah, no, I don't tweet a whole lot. I like to keep informed. I still get on there. I'm, I'm following the Shattered Shield, so I know what's going on. Well, I do want to thank you for coming on here and doing this. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Andrew, for uh, your interest in the show in the first place and making a, a cool thing of your own out of it. We'll be talking to him at the Let's end of it. Go. We're going to get to hear from Ronnie Gardaki himself. All right. This particular episode old, starts off. Ye old burning man. Yeah. 